and and now I'm just thrilled to welcome Hal Real to the program. And Hal, thank you so much for for joining us today. I know you've well, we all have had a busy day, so yours is probably not busier than everybody else's. But I know you've you've got a lot going on today. So, yep. thanks thank very much. Appreciate it, Michael. Good to see you, Bill. Yeah. So, Hal, you you've worn so many hats or wearing so many hats in the community. Um, could you start uh, just by talking a little bit about World Cafe Live and the, the role that that organization plays, um, not just as a venue, but as much more than just a, just a music venue. Well, could you just sort of talk a bit about the mission and history of the, uh, of the space? Sure, uh, honored to do so. Yeah, World Cafe Live um, opened in 2004 um, as one half of the House of Music at 3025 Walnut Street in West Philly, University City. Um, the other half being our partners at WXPN. And um, we, uh, it's, it's been quite a journey. Um, and of course, we did an average of 500 ticketed shows a year, a couple hundred free events and shows. And um, we are very much a community center, not only for uh, concerts, but for community convenings, uh, for tech conferences, for social events. Um, we really are a gathering place for the community. And um, it's really important to us that we are so multifaceted and, and have become you know, a house of music and much more for so many of our fans and so many of our friends in the community. Uh, and, and a significant event for us, in addition to the more traditional uh, house of concerts and partnering with XPN and lots of great joint ventures, is that in 2008, when the um, recession hit and the music programs in Philadelphia really were slashed, uh, we couldn't sit idly by knowing we had some resources to, to see for however long Philadelphia students not be exposed to music. So we brought together a group of musicians and philanthropists and teaching teachers and teaching artists and said, look, we've got resources we're willing to put in, what can we do? And we created uh, what was then a, a, a nonprofit partner and is now, we're now one nonprofit, one unified nonprofit. It's now World Cafe Live Education. Um, and we put together uh, a team of artists and started bringing in students uh, at about 100 at a time for innovative, interactive sessions at World Cafe Live during the day. We do about 50 a year, about 100 students a time at a time. So we've had over 50, 50 to 60,000 students since 2008 who've uh, participated in these bridge sessions. And it's just been great. It's, it's all about, not so much about um, turning kids into musicians as helping them see the world and culture through a musical lens mm -hmm. and to understand the interconnectivity of, of drums from Ghana with drums from Brazil and of dance, uh, you know, in, in, in West Africa with dance in America and, uh, and everything you can imagine. That, that classic and classical and blues and soul and hip hop all have so much in common. And that's been a great experience. We've always been very mission driven. And uh, as a result of that work, we then started doing work in the schools and in the community and it's just grown and grown. And so now, you know, we're one unified nonprofit. We do things, lots of things, lots of work at World Cafe Live, but also in the community. Yeah, that's, that's, that's. we have, um been so happy to showcase so many of the, the kind of creative youth development initiatives as that sector is just kind of becoming more and more robust. And, and they're so, it, it's always so encouraging just to see the local grassroots entrepreneurial, you know, kind of energy around how do we, you know, connect our youth to music in meaningful ways that again, are not based on them being consumers or being marketed to, but, but really being welcomed into what, music can bring, you know, which again, whether or not you want to pursue a career in the music industry or have the gift to, to record or, or perform, or you just appreciate it and just understand what it means. And um, it, it's, it's so, you know, again, I'm, I'm so happy to have you on with Bill today because it's so interesting to think about the sort of invest, ongoing investment in community nonprofit infrastructure that can really be transformational, you know, while it's still just kind of doing like doing the thing, but it's, doing this thing too, you know, in, in ways that we can understand. Could you speak a little bit more, Hal, about your relationship with, with XPN and, and kind of how that came about and 
what that has meant for both organizations. Um, yeah, it, it, it's going back a ways now. Uh, yeah. I actually first approached XPM with the idea of creating this house of music in 1998. And it was uh, six years later when we, when the station moved in and we opened our two venues. Um, really the notion was that at that time, uh, there were lots of uh, places for music in Philadelphia, not compared to today, but there were, there were at least a handful of good places for live music in Philadelphia that really catered towards an under 30 audience. Mm -hmm. And um, we wanted to build a place that catered to all audiences of all ages. So that you didn't feel like you were too old if you were a music head like me and went in there at the age of 50. Um, and you didn't feel too young if you were there, you know, either, but it worked for everybody. And the notion was um, really to work with XPN also in terms of presenting emerging artists and being a house for that. So we licensed the name World Cafe for their radio show that at that time was, I don't know, maybe uh, 15 years old, I forget. Mm -hmm. Now it's about 30 years old. Uh, at that time, it went to seven stations around the country. Now it goes to over 200 stations. And so uh, we became the physical extension of that virtual cafe. Uh, mm -hmm. I can remember the tourist, tourist office people in Philadelphia saying, wow, now when people come and say, where is World Cafe? We don't have to say it's virtual. We can say 3025 Walnut. Yeah. Uh, so it was terrific. You know, we, we spent a lot of time, uh, Roger LeMay, Bill's counterpart and my partner who runs WXPM. We spent a lot of time the first two years explaining around the country. We're two different organizations. One's nonprofit public radio. The other is the music venues. But we live together under one roof and share a common philosophy. And after two years of giving those speeches, we realized Nobody cared. All they cared about was, you know, who owned it and how it worked it didn't matter. What mattered was it was this great vibe, this great house of music. Was the music great? Was your beer cold? Wow, this is, this is really wonderful. And, and that's where it's gone. And we've created great programming together from our Friday free at noon concerts that are webcast all over the world now um, to the non-commercial radio conference every spring and lots of other things that we do. So it's, um, it's, it's been great for um, representing Philadelphia, the Philadelphia music scene uh, and, and being, you know, being a real kind of, as I said, house of music for Philly. Well, I, I can certainly attest to uh, the fact that the programming uh, at the non-com convention uh, was spectacular and the beer was delicious. So well, well done on, on both fronts, but the, um, so I wanted to, to broaden out a little bit and, and talk about um, your role with NEVA and the National Independent Venue Association, of course. And, you know, what a, an amazing success story. And we've talked a bunch about it on the show, so we don't need to do kind of the whole, you know, war stories about how it started. But could you talk a little bit about your perspective on that organization coming together and the role that you're playing on the board? Um, yeah, I'm glad to. Thank you. I, I, I do have to go back to how it started because it's very much informs my perspective. Yeah. Uh, because I think it's important for people to understand that the idea of starting NEVA predated the pandemic. Okay. And uh, it was just February 24th of 2019 when Reverend Moose, our executive director, and I met in New York and had lunch. And I said, Moose, you started Independent Venue Week. Um, we, we from World Cafe Live want to put some of our assets, our resources, and my time into organizing independent venues to have a collective voice because we're all too busy keeping the lights on, but what we really need to get together, there's a lot that we can do to help each other. And we said, yep. I said, I don't want to step on your toes if that's where you're headed. He said, nope, but I'd love to work on it with you. We said, great. This summer, we'll get a bunch of people together in Philly, form a steering committee, and see what happens. And three weeks later, February 13th was our last show. We've been dark for almost a year. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, March 13th. And um, we said, we can't wait until the summer. We need to get the, that steering committee on the phone right now. And fast forwarding a year later, there's 3,000 members of NEVA uh, in all 50 states and in DC. Uh, our mission when I met with Moose was not at all about, um, you know, this tremendous advocacy program that we created. 
advocacy was part of what we do, but it was about sharing best practices and things like that. Uh, but under the circumstances, we quickly realized that we needed to try to save the sector or it was going down. And that's tough to do with a sector that's had no voice. Nobody knew what we meant by independent venue even. Uh, and for, for people participating, the, the quick definition is these are locally controlled, uh, primarily, you know, mom and pop businesses or small nonprofit organizations. These are nonprofit, they're for profit, they're venues, they're festivals, and there are some promoters as well who work with these kinds of facilities and festivals. Um, you know, we had an ex existential need. It was quite clear to us that we were the first to close and we will be the last to open. You know, people asked a lot over the last year, well, you've got drive-in concerts and you've got virtual concerts. And we're like, those are grains of sand for an industry that needs a beach. You know, we knew that, uh, and, and lately there's been so much talk about rapid reopening and so forth. Well, I was just interviewed on the local news in Philly earlier this week, and they may not have liked what I had to say, but the question was, you know, aren't you excited about the rollback of the restrictions? And I said, the restrictions aren't what's keeping us closed. I mean, yeah, they mandated our closure. It's the pandemic. We're, we're not going to reopen. We can't reopen if it's not safe for our staff, for our performers, and for our fans, our guests. We have no interest in doing that. And partial reopening for an industry that can barely get by at 100% is just a road to ruin. So we made our case and, uh, you know, in a time when there was a lot about our democracy that gave us all pause, it was very reaffirming for those of us involved in this lobbying effort that we literally got to know every member of Congress, their legislative director, their chief of staff, and had tremendous bipartisan support, which speaks volumes about music. We could get on these calls, whether they were Republicans and Demo or Democrats and say, look, this isn't a big city issue. This isn't a small town issue. It's rural, it's, it's urban, it's red and it's blue. It's, it's music, it's concerts. And the support that we got just shows that. Now we hardly expected when we started the social media movement and the tagline behind me, save our stages, that we would end up in a $15 billion piece of legislation. Um, but we're thrilled that it did and of course, that legislation benefits a lot more than just Neva and its members. And that's great. Our, our whole thing was this needs to benefit the businesses who have suffered the most during the pandemic. So, you know, I think the threshold for the act is like if you've lost 30% of your revenue compared to 2019. Neva members have lost 90%, in our case, 110%. Not only do we have no revenue to speak of since March, We've had hundreds of thousands of dollars of tickets to refund, of event deposits to refund. It's truly an economic disaster. And flipping the script for a second, very importantly, we are going to be critical to a resilient recovery. Yep. If, if these places across the country are boarded up, we're not gonna be putting heads in beds in hotels, filling bars, filling restaurants, and creating that dynamic that everybody really needs to be successful in their nightlife economy. So um, it has been a silver lining. Speaking, I know Bill was talking about silver linings and you were. It's been a silver lining for all of us to Misery Loves Company to be working together. You have all these venues that are shut down and all these people who really needed the camaraderie. We're so excited about our plans beyond the pandemic, but right now our focus is on implementation of what's called the Shuttered Venue Operators Grants the SVOG, um, along with safe reopening and, and being a leader to help our venues and other venues open safely, get confidence, you know, make the public confident that we are not super spreaders. We are safe places to come and go back to enjoying live music. And yeah, that's you, the short -term goal. you said so much there, Hal, to, to build off of. I, I really appreciate all that. Um, you know, certainly just to amplify on the safety side, of course, that's, you know, we, we've been very proud of the Reopen Every Venue Safely or Revs initiative. Um, on March 15th, we're announcing the uh, 2021 cohort cities um, that are, are coming on board. 
um, to supplement our 2020 pilot cities and, and, and we'll be dedicating this program to that topic on March 19th. Um, but you're exactly right because this is a, a challenge, a communications challenge for our community that we've never thought about before. This is about get you know people to turn out for the rock show. This is about trust and transparency and a lot of what has been incredibly edifying to me and our revs team has been the um, the commitment that our, our our community partners have had around the health and safety of venue employees and musicians and crew, and obviously you know to to navigate the economic crisis with the other side of the crisis is is a really difficult balance. But you know this community has really stepped up in ways that um, give us a lot of hope for the future. And 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 I loved I you know what you said about Neva. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, it's one thing to organize in a crisis and fight for the lives. And it's another thing to say, where does this power take us? Where do we go with this? What, what could this mean? And to the, the conversation that Bill and I were having a few minutes ago, how does this fit into the challenge that all music advocates have had, or many of us have, have had for a long time, which is how do we fundamentally realign the value of music and culture in our society? You know, and and and, and what does that look like in, in pragmatic ways? So, um so thank you so much for, for your work and thank you for walking us through some of that history. That's great to hear. And, 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 and it's such a great reminder, um, you know, stuff that, that, I mean, you know, deja vu stuff that, you know, we always said back in the day and in, in, in our early future music days, you know, policy gets made by those who show up and the only barrier to, you know, make it impossible for the music community to not succeed in the policy process is to not get in the policy process. I mean, do the work people want to hear, they want to know what's going on. So it's super interesting. Um, so as a reminder, folks, if you have questions for these superstar guests, put them in the Q and a, um, we're happy to, to kind of get your feedback and there's some great stuff in, in the chat that we're seeing. Mm-hmm.